All right, let's get this party started. Hello, everybody. I'm here to tell you about time zones. Yeah, I'm also surprised that they accepted my talk. Maybe the polar's part of the title is what did it. Either way, it's quite a niche, small topic, so that's why I think we can cover everything there is to know about this small topic. Cool, I'm uh, Marco Gorelli. I work at Quantsite Labs. I have about a day a week on pandas, a day a week on polars, and the rest of my time on assorted projects, such as the Consortium for Python Data API Standards, which is trying to improve interoperability within the Python data frame landscape. Cool stuff. How is today going to work? I'm going to start by making a convincing case for why you should never, ever, ever, ever deal with time zones by hand. Then, I'm going to give a quick crash course on what you need to know about Polars to understand the rest of the talk. Any Polars users in the house tonight? Woo! Got uh, some, but also some people not putting their hands up. So if you didn't put your hand up, that's fine. You're going to learn everything you need to know to understand part three, which is Polars and time zone specific things. If you did put your hand up, then I hope that I can still teach you something new or a new way to think about Polars and expressions. Uh, after that, finally, we've got an engaging Q&A and an awkward silence. It's uh, up to you what the length of X is. Uh, Richie, you missed me asking people if they were uh, Polars users, but um, I was curious to see whether you'd put your hand up redundantly or not. Either way. <laughs> cool. Let's do this. Let's start with part one, why you should never, ever, ever deal with time zones manually if you can. So let's have another show of hands. Any flat earthers in the house tonight? Oh, wow, the Dutch education system is really as good as people say it is. Somehow I think if I was giving this talk back at home in the UK, at least a few people would unironically have put their hands up. Glad to see that didn't happen here. I'm uh, not a flat earther myself. Not a flat earther, just in case anyone was uh, misunderstanding me. But I do see the appeal of this conspiracy theory. Like I. I do wish the Earth was flat. It would make so many things m m much more simple. Like, uh, days would always have 24 hours. December the 30th would always come after December the 29th. Yeah, believe it or not, that's not always true. And uh, scheduling recurring cross-continent meetings would actually be possible. Anyone who's tried doing that will know it's... it's you're going to have at least a few weeks a year where, because of daylight savings time, somebody shows up, somebody else shows up an hour later. That's just the way it's going to be. Speaking of daylight savings time, let's uh, introduce the concept in the most British way possible, that is to say, with a pub quiz. So, suppose it's midnight on the 26th of March, 2023, here in the beautiful Eindhoven, and uh, you then wait four hours. What time is it? Okay, in order to unlock the next slide, I'm going to need an answer from the audience. 5 a.m. <laughs> it was either going to be 5 or 3, definitely not 4. So who said 5? Okay, you win a Polar sticker. Well done. And uh, yeah, I'm impressed you were able to do that in your head. So let's uh, learn about why. What is this uh, nonsense tradition of uh, disruptive scheduling tradition? So. It's got two parts. In October, I think uh, once upon a time, somebody was enjoying a party so much, they decided they didn't want to get up for work the next day. So when it got to 2 a.m., they figured, yeah, let's go, let's repeat this hour. Just so good, let's do it again. And so the day ended up having 25 hours. Uh, so this unfortunately leads to ambiguity. Like a 2.15, what time is that? Nobody knows. If it's 1.45 and you're waiting for somebody and they tell you, I'll be there at 2.15, you need to know they're not necessarily half an hour away, they might be one and a half hours away. Then, in March, we've got the opposite problem. Somebody was evidently very keen to get to work the next day and just chopped off an hour. So between uh, 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. didn't exist. Uh, this is a good way of sniffing out uh, bullshit stories. If somebody's telling you about an amazing thing they did at 2.30 a.m. on the 26th of March 2023 in Eindhoven, you need to know they are bullshitting you. That never happened. This daytime does not exist. Now, you might be thinking, this is not that bad. Like, yeah, sure, it's confusing, but at least it's consistent. Like, we just write down a few rules, so this is when it changes, this is when it goes back, and then we can deal with it. Not that bad, is it? Well, 
If there was at least some consistency, maybe it wouldn't be that bad. However, let's take a look at what happened in 2023. So on the 26th of March, here in Netherlands, you skipped an hour. Meanwhile, your American colleagues also skipped an hour, but they did it two weeks earlier. Then, in most Asian countries and most African countries, they looked at DST and were like, yeah, this is uh, colonialist bullshit, we're not going to do this. So they don't observe DST at all. Uh, but not, not, not all of them. Like in Africa, in Morocco, they actually do something like daylight savings time, except they do it in the opposite direction than we do, and in the week between when we and Americans do it, just to add to the confusion. And then, in, just in case it wasn't bad enough, Australia comes along, and in one of their time zones, because yes, Australia has multiple time zones in the same country, they figured, let's, let's move the clocks, but on a different day, and let's also move them by just half an hour, not the full hour. Absolute mess. But again, you might not be convinced. You might think, I can, you know, it's at least consistent year after year, I can just write this down, a few if-then statements, and it'll all be hunky-dory. Except, in 2011, Samoa decided they would change which time zone they were in. They were sick of being in UTC minus 10, and decided they wanted to be in UTC plus 14. So, at uh, nearly midnight on the 29th of December, one moment later, it was the 31st of December. The 30th of December never happened if that was your anniversary. Tough luck. So I hope I've made the convincing case that you should never, ever, ever deal with time zones by hand, QED. If you do, you'll forget about one of these subtleties like uh, DST, cross-country changes, uh, countries uh, changing their minds about things. So yeah, don't do it. Instead, use polars. So let's learn about polars. Little super fast crash course, everything you need to know about polars to understand how to deal with time zones in polars. Let's get this party started. So the, fo the most fundamental object within polars is the data frame. Data frame is just a collection of columns, each one of which holds some elements which have to have a consistent data type. Got lots of different data types, we're going to talk about them a bit later, but before we do, let's talk about expressions. Let's learn about how, in the words of Dr. Dre, you can express yourself. A expression, you can think of it as a lazy column, like a function. Like if I make a function which uh, is something like, uh, if I take an input and I double it, well, what's the value of this function? It doesn't have a value until you give it an input. And similarly, an expression doesn't have a value until you give it a data frame. So, if we write an expression like pl.col a times 2 alias b, it doesn't have a value. It's just a freestanding function. It maps a data frame to a column, and once we put this in a data frame context, it will actually produce a series. Most people don't really necessarily think of it like this. I think most people just try using expressions, find them quite intuitive, and uh, don't stop to think about the fact that they are functions. Maybe Technically, they're not, but this is how I like to think about them. So let's look at an example. This will make it very intuitive to anyone who's not tried using them before. Let's get started. So if we start with a beautiful data frame like the one on top, which has a single column A with values 1, 1, and 2, we can make a data frame just like that one, but with an extra column defined by the expression I showed you before. We just take column A, double all its values, rename, rename it to B, and there it is. Well, that was fun. Let's do it again. Another example. Now we can use inequality uh, comparisons within our expressions, so we can make Boolean masks. And then we can use these Boolean masks to filter out certain rows. Like, we want to keep all rows where column A is uh, greater than 1. We just pass that to filter, and then filter will take our data frame, give it as input to the expression, and produce a data frame which only keeps the rows where column A is greater than 1. Um, are you missing me talking about time zones? Yes, I'm sure you are, so let's now talk about how this helps us deal with time zones. But first, we need to talk about data types. Do you want a bit of audience interaction? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Pretty pumped up Dutch crowd. So, gonna read out a few data types, and uh, I'd like you to give me a cheer when you hear your favorite data type being uh, read out. <laughs> so let's start with numeric. 
Okay, got some uh, data scientists here in the front, I presume. Okay, Boolean! <laughs> wow, pretty Boolean reaction there. Stayed si completely silent for the first one and then hooted out on the second one. Cool, understood the assignment. String! Okay, some NLP scientists down there. Yes, <laughs> nice. Categorical. Yeah, maybe if I'd said it with more enthusiasm, I'd have got a few more responses. All right, let's try nested data types! <laughs> Woo, yeah. There's actually a talk on YouTube about why somebody switched two polars, and the first number one reason they give is the list data type. It's truly phenomenal. So yeah, look into it. And then finally, I really like putting time zones on things. So my favorite data type is uh, date time, because I can put a time zone on it. But that's not the only thing I can put on a date time. I can also put a time unit. So let's learn what these two things are, and uh, let's look at some examples. So first of all, time unit. This is just the precision. So what's the smallest amount of time that it can represent? It can be nanosecond, microsecond, or the currently useless millisecond. On the other side of the board, we've got the time zone. Now, this can either be none, and if you're lucky enough to not have to think of uh, time zones, then by all means, set this to none and keep living the dream. But if you're in the unfortunate situation where you do need to think about time zones, you'll need to put something from the time zone database. So none of this, uh, like, I don't know, abbreviations that could be ambiguous, you know, Europe slash Amsterdam, Europe slash London, Asia slash Kathmandu, that's my favorite one, you know put something that's unambiguous and well-defined. Right, why do we need a time unit? Let's uh, take a step back and revise how date times are represented by computers. They're represented as the amount of time since 1970, 1st of January, in universal coordinated time. And uh, just to prove to you that I'm not lying, I've uh, made a little data frame with a single date time, which is the 30th of November, at uh, 12 a.m. and I've then shown the physical representation of it on the right. If we then take this number and then add that number of microseconds to 1971st of January, we recover our original date time. So yeah, there, I didn't lie to you. What about time zones? Time zones actually modify these integer representations of date times. If we compare the integer backing the same time here in uh, Eindhoven and that time in universal coordinated time, then the underlying timestamps are different. And if you subtract them and, div and then divide by the number of microseconds in an in a in a second, you sh in a, in, oh, in an hour, sorry, you'll get one because we are currently one hour ahead of universal coordinated time. Cool stuff. Right, let's get on to the exciting part of the uh, presentation, polars and time zones. And I'm going to start this by quoting from the Zen of Python. You know, we're at PyData, so I figure this uh, is going to be acceptable. When I quoted from it at an R conference last week, didn't uh, get a very warm reception. Yeah, joking, of course, I didn't attend an R conference. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in the Zen of Python, it says that namespaces are one honking great idea. And uh, Python has excellent type hints, so use them to your advantage. If you just start typing an expression and then type .dt, well, .dt is the namespace which gives you access to all of the functions which work on temporal data types. So if you're looking for something, just start typing, and then just uh, scroll down, scroll through until you find something which looks like it might be what you need. Saves opening a separate tab. Right, so if we keep going for long enough, you'll find my favorite function in the world, replace time zone. Let's, uh, let's look at it in action. Let's start with a data frame of times here in the beautiful Eindhoven, and then let's uh, use replace time zone to change the time zone both to uh, UTC and to Asia Kathmandu. Look, isn't it beautiful? They are like five hours and 45 minutes ahead of uh, UTC. I think they wanted that when the sun was uh, at the highest point, it would be directly over Mount Kilimanjaro at some time of the year, something like that. Not sure what they're going to do when tectonic shift means that that's no longer the case. But uh, presumably by then, you'll all be using polars to do time zone arithmetic for you, so you won't need to worry about it. And uh, as you can see, the local time zones are the same. 
So we haven't actually changed the local time zones here. We've just changed the, sorry, we haven't changed the local date times. We've just changed the time zone of them. But you might similarly be interested in asking the question, well, if it's uh, 1 a.m. here in uh, Eindhoven, what time is it for our colleagues in Nepal? And to answer that question, you're going to want to use convert time zone. And now this will show you, ah, in Nepal, it's uh, 5.45 a.m. So when should you use one? When should you use the other? If you're trying to answer a question of the kind, what time is it now but somewhere else? Convert time zone. If you're trying to answer a question, what if it was this local time but somewhere else? Then replace time zone. Now uh, we had a pub quiz earlier, one by this gentleman in the front, well done. So let's uh, have another one. I'm going to ask you the same question, but this time the answer is... Uh, let's use Polars. Let's see how Polars uh, could have answered this question for us. But first, I need to introduce to you the amazing function offset by. Offset by does what it says on the tin. It'll take a date time and then shift it forwards by a certain offset. You can shift forwards by days, weeks, months, hours, milliseconds, seconds, and so on. So we want to shift forwards by four hours, so let's, uh, let's use that. We're going to start by creating a series with uh, the 26th of March. We then localize it to Europe Amsterdam, and then we shift it forwards by four hours, and indeed we confirm that the gentleman in the front was correct in the shouting out 5 a.m. Well done. Now there is a word of caution, because I showed you before that we've got both D and H. And you might be thinking, okay, 1D, 24H, same thing, not quite. As you might have expected by now, this far in the talk. 1D just means one calendar day. So let's move to the next day, but at the same hour. Whereas 24 hours literally just means 24 hours. It's, it's unambiguous, 24 hours, yeah. So if we start on the 29th of October, midnight, here in Eindhoven, Moving forwards 1D shifts us to the 30th, whereas moving forwards 24 hours shifts us to 11 p.m. Which one do you want? I think most of the time you're probably going to want 1D. So, yeah, just be mindful of the difference and uh, use the correct one appropriately. Now, whenever I talk about time zones, there's always some smarty pants who comes up to me and says, yeah, but we could just use UTC. We don't need time zones. So let me dispel this myth. So, why can't we just do everything in UTC and then convert back? Well, let's try to do that. Suppose you've got some sales data, you've got some uh, date times and uh, some numbers of uh, sales, and your boss asks you, okay, please uh, prepare me a report. For every day, I want to know how many items did we sell. So if you just uh, looked at this, you'd see, okay, well, for the 29th of November, 1 plus 3 plus 1, if my maths is correct, that's 5. And then 30th of November, 1. However, if you listened to Smarty Pants on Reddit, you would have converted it to UTC. You would have seen, okay, for the 28th of November, we've got 1. For the 29th of November, we've got 4. And for the 30th of November, we'd got 1. And uh, if your boss asks you, why do you have a data point for the 28th of November? I didn't even give you that in my data set. And you respond, well, someone on Reddit told me to convert to UTC. You won't seem so smart. So unfortunately, that's why we need to use uh, time zones. Also, as I showed you earlier, 1D isn't always 24 hours. And if you set the correct local time zone, then Polars will deal f with this for you. Unfortunately, we don't always get data fully formed in uh, data frames. The world runs on CSVs, as uh, demonstrated by issue trackers and uh, surveys. So I'm going to show you a super secret trick for dealing with CSVs and polars. And that is try pass dates equals true. Uh, then pol um, polars will try to infer the date format for you, and then it'll super efficiently pass the CSV file, um, passing any column of strings which corresponds to a date uh, format as a date time or as a date. Uh, it's more efficient than first reading it as string and then converting to a date or date time. 
But what if your CSV contains offsets, like uh, plus 2, plus 1, and so on? And here, Polars does the same thing that PyArrow does. Uh, gentle reminder, Polars is not based on PyArrow. Just uh, thought I'd get that out there to make Richie and the back smile. So, the, why does the conversion to UTC happen? Why does Polars not just like infer the time zone for you automatically from your data? And the answer is, it, it doesn't know. I'll show you exactly what I mean, not in the next slide, but in the one after. But first, I'll tell you what you can use to deal with this if you know that your local time zone is, say, Europe slash Amsterdam. And that is, you can just specify that as the data type. So, polite reminder, date time, we need to specify two parameters, which are the time unit and the time zone. US, that is microseconds, and then Europe slash Amsterdam, that is the time zone. And if we do that, we do in indeed get some uh, date times which look like they really did come from uh, the Netherlands. Like they all at uh, they're all at midnight and they change um, offset when the Netherlands observes daylight savings time. Why couldn't Polars do this for you? Well, let's have another pub quiz. Suppose it's the 29th of October 2023 at midnight, two hours ahead of UTC. If you wait for f 24 hours, what time is your clock going to show? The answer is, you don't know. So here in Eindhoven, it would show you the... Um, it would show you 11 p.m. on the 29th of October, one hour ahead of UTC. But in uh, Botswana, it would show you the 30th of October. So, you don't know. Polars will not uh, guess it for you, and this will save you a lot of headaches later in your pipeline. It's better if things work predictably and consistently. So convert to UTC, and then it's up to you to set the time zone, which you hopefully should know that your data corresponds to. So in uh, confusion, what have we talked about today? First of all, I hope I demonstrated definitively to you that you should never, ever, ever deal with time zones manually if you can help it. Then we did a very quick uh, crash course on Polars, learned the basics of how to work with it and deal with date times. And then finally, we learned about time zones in Polars, about how 1D is one calendar day and 24H is 24 hours. We learned about the difference between replace time zone and convert time zones for changing between time zones. And then we learned about how passing offset aware strings in when reading a CSV file will result in UTC time zone, and it's up to you to set the time zone which you hopefully know that your data corresponds to. Eindhoven, you've been absolutely fantastic. Now please go out and convert some time zones. I've been Marco. Please pip install Polars. Have a great time at the rest of your conference. Respect the code of conduct. Get in contact if you want some training. And please ask any questions. Thank you. Right, not all at once. Uh, yeah, so how do you deal with um, ambiguity in offset, offsets for date times, which you often run into with pandas? If you say, I want one month in the future, yeah, how many days is that month? Uh, that's a great question. So calendar is a, so month is one calendar month. So if you start like on the 31st of January, and you add one month, that goes to the 28th or the 29th of February, depending on the year. So it, it literally, it's not a fixed quantity. It will just increment the month by one and then saturate to the largest date in that month. If, uh, if the particular month, th if, if the particular date you're trying to get to does not exist. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> you can if you want to. <laughs> Got a few here. Um, unless it's a leap year, yeah. Thought you were so smart, didn't you? <laughs> All right, got a question there towards the back. Can you start a year not on the uh, January the 1st? 
Can I start the year not on January the 1st? And it may be a stupid question, but we deal with seasonality in our uh, data. So we want to have uh, January 1st in the middle of our graphs rather than at the beginning or the end. So can you give me an example of an operation which you'd want to do? Because Yeah, for just a uh, basically visualization already. So uh, Tineke, my colleague, they solved this now. I think, I think you did it manually. <laughs> Uh, so uh, Polos itself does not do visualization. You'll have to use. I understand. Okay. Uh, sorry, I. Uh, yeah, uh, d don't worry. <laughs> okay. Well, to try to interpret the question. So if I you're it's doing the same thing as if you if you work in the financial world and the year ends at uh, uh, the 30th of November, you have the same thing. Okay, sure. So let's mm -hmm. say if you want to find, let's say, the total by year, then can you set year? to start at a different point. All right, cool. Uh, so the, the function for resampling by year in Polos is called group by dynamic. So in that one, you can specify uh, how often you want your groups to start. So you could specify that to be one year. But then, if I remember correctly, there's also an offset parameter. So you could set the offset to be whatever you want, such that then the 1st of January ends up where you want it to be. So if you look in the docs, there's the exact formula for how the groups are created. And by combining every period and offset, I'd like to think that you'd be able to uh, represent whatever exact period you want. Uh, I'm going to take the chance to self-promote here, because if you need to specifically deal with uh, business days, so if you want logic to say skip weekends or skip holidays, then you can use a Polar's plugin called Polar's slash business, which will deal with those complexities for you. And if any of this is not addressed, <laughs> if any of this isn't addressed, uh, if it's yeah not easy, please uh, do join the Discord. Super active, join the issue, uh, open an issue on GitHub. Uh, if it can't be done, then yeah, we'd be very interested in trying to make it easy for people. After all, the shared goal is to change the world using the power of Polars, and uh, we can do that more easily if uh, we've got clear requests. Right. Got uh, three minutes okay. left, I think. Yeah, any other questions? Just start, yeah, in the back. All right, yeah, still okay. got questions. Uh, more interest than I thought in time zones. Good to see. Uh, who had a question? Thought everybody would be going to the Pixie talk. Hey, thank you. Thanks for coming. Can you parse <coughs> uh, different time zones? So because, because you showed the example where you specify the time zone, but if you have d uh, different time zones. That's, uh, yeah, so in this example, we've got different offsets within the same file, uh, but... But because it was the same time zone. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. if you had like uh, plus two and then plus one and then plus three or something, that's a lot trickier yeah. because in uh, Polars, each column has to have a specified time zone. So what Polars would do here is it, it would convert everything to UTC. Okay. And if you've got different offsets, I would hope that you've also got a column telling you what local time zone that came from. So then you could partition your rows based on that other column and then convert each one to its local time zone. But yeah, you'd have to do it in two steps. Okay. There was actually a feature request recently about being able to do this in a single step within lazy, with a lazy frame. So being able to use lazy computation for this. It's currently not possible, but I think it's a reasonable feature request. So hopefully we'll be able to find a solution for this either in a plugin or in uh, Polars itself. Okay, final question. Well, it's more of a personal question. How can I develop your um, showman presentation skills <laughs> and be in the same time zone as you? Uh, sure, so uh, step one is uh, when you're 18, have the bad idea of thinking that in life you want to be a musician <laughs> and then uh, perform in uh, pubs and experience nobody paying attention to you and uh, learn that if you want to catch people's attention, you need to really ask for it and uh, provide a bit of entertainment. And then uh, number four, burn out and become a data scientist. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marco, for the very energetic talk. Uh, thank you. <laughs>